a very, very warm welcome to the latest in the series of um, MAX or um, Milton Abbey Experiences talks um, that we're holding every Wednesday evening. Um, it's lovely to see um, so many of you joining us this evening and we're extremely um, fortunate and um, to have with us and, and grateful to Rose Shaw Taylor, who's going to be speaking to us tonight um, on a talk which is entitled From Pillar to Post, A Short History of Architecture. So without any further ado, Rose, welcome. Thank you very much. and. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here uh, talking to you this evening and thank you for joining me for this um, very prompt romp through the history of architecture. And I'm going to share my screen with you now without further ado, as they say, and let's get cracking. So, welcome to this talk on uh, the history of architecture. And I want to start by just asking you the question, when you go into town, any town, when you go to the shops, when you go to the bank, how often do you look up above the shop fronts at the buildings above? How often do you stop and think, oh, that's a Georgian building or oh, that's a Tudor building? How often when you're at school, do you look at the buildings around you and notice all the different styles of architecture that there are there? Or are you like most of us not looking at anything much really? When you go shopping, you don't always notice what's around you. And as a nation, uh, the UK is known for being more literary than visual. We're not very good necessarily at noticing what's around us. And so we sometimes neglect the visual arts and architecture particularly compared to some other nations. I learned to recognize the different architect architectural styles from a book. This is it. Uh, it went through each period of history with drawings of the different styles and the different periods. And it's the drawings that stuck in my mind. I never actually read the book. I used to just look at the pictures. And so I'm going to take the same approach this evening. I'm going to gallop through the centuries with you. And by the end, I hope that you'll know how to recognise a Gothic building and you'll know what blobby texture is. So let's go. The first question is, when did architecture begin? We date it from the magnificent structures of ancient Greece and Rome, or perhaps the pyramids. But humans were designing and constructing buildings long before that. Shelter is after all a basic human need. And in the West, we start with the period known as classical, that is ancient Greece and Rome, and their buildings grew from ideas and construction techniques that evolved centuries and eons apart and in distant locations. And something to keep the rain off isn't the only reason for building. Before recorded history, humans were constructing earthen mounds, stone circles, megaliths, and things that still puzzle archeologists. Prehistoric architecture includes the monumental structures like Stonehenge, cliff dwellings in America, and thatch and mud structures that have long since been lost to time. The dawn of architecture is really found in these structures. We don't know why primitive people began building in a geometric fashion. Archaeologists can only guess that prehistoric people looked to the heavens and imitated the sun and the stars and the moon, using that circular shape in their creations to reproduce them as earth mounds and monolithic henges and even dwellings. The complex design and interrelationship of these really early monuments are evidence of a very organized prehistoric society able to impose its concepts on the environment. And in fact, it's that ability to change the environment which is the key for a structure to be called architecture rather than just a building. Of all the art forms, architecture is the one that tells you most about the people and the society who made it. Here's I.M. Pei, the architect of the famous Louvre Pyramid. And here's what he says, architecture is the very mirror of life. You have only to cast your eyes on buildings to feel the presence of the past the spirit of a place. They are the reflection of society. So let's keep these words in mind as we go off through history. 
First stop, classical. Classical architecture. This is the style of buildings in ancient Greece and Rome. And the classical architectural style shapes our approach to building in the Western world. And it still does today. Why they've lasted so long for thousands of years is because the Greeks adapted a method of building in wood to stone. They constructed their buildings using a system called post and lintel. And that is not a novel concept. The post and lintel is something we've seen before. It crops up at Stonehenge. From the rise of ancient Greece until the fall of the Roman Empire, great buildings were constructed according to very precise rules. Architects were good at maths. They believed that builders should use the mathematical principles when constructing temples. And as they said, without symmetry and proportion, no temple can have a regular plan. The Greeks invented the orders of architecture, the rules for how a column should look. Here they are, Doric, Ionic and Corinthian. And every building in ancient Greece used one or other of these three styles. Now at first sight you might say, well, okay, nothing could be easier than lining up a load of columns. But it's only when you realize what a large part illusion plays and how many of these straight lines that you see here are actually curved that you realize just how good these guys were. It's actually something which I don't understand, but it took centuries of practice and experiment to achieve the final impression of simplicity that's achieved at the Parthenon. It's the ability to make a shape, uh, use a, a technique called entarsis, to make a shape look straight um, from a distance by actually curving it. And that's what the Greeks did. They took account of the optical illusion of seeing a row of columns and put it into practice. There'd be, yeah, the, the maths teachers will be able to tell you more about this than I can. But it took centuries of practice to achieve this final impression of simplicity. And it was an architect of the 20th century who coined the phrase, but it's just as relevant here, less is more. So it looks easy, but actually it's really complicated. The Romans adopted all the rules of Greeks um, and they reused all the orders, they loved the orders, but they had one big difference and that was the invention of the arch. This meant that they could build multi-storey buildings and this was a big departure. A multi-storey building had not existed in Greece. So we get the Colosseum and they also invented the use of concrete, um, which is why this building here, the Pantheon, is still standing. You can go into the center of Rome and walk into this building and it's still in pretty good condition, which is quite an amazing feat. They also produced the idea of rectangular plans. This is kind of town planning where it would be more suitable to pack buildings closely together along streets and have planned cities rather than just having them all higgledy-piggledy all over the place. The next place on our, on our whistle-stop tour is Byzantium. The Byzantines are a very important um, part of the story. When the Roman Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, he moved his center of operations away from Rome and to the east. And his center was called Constantinople, now Istanbul. And the most famous example, of course, of a Byzantine church is the Hagia Sophia, which was built originally as a Christian church, but now we know it as a mosque. And it has more domes and the addition of minarets which has changed its appearance, but it was originally one of the early Christian churches. So Constance, Constantine, the emperor, is thinking, how can I, how can I adapt this, all the knowledge of Rome to suit Christian churches, what Christian worship, uh, and, and the need to be able to fit a lot of people into the congregation was one thing and quite elaborate processions was another. And so he adapted not the, the Greek and, and Roman temple forms, 
but the Roman basilica, which was actually um, used, the point about a basilica was it was used as a law court. The uh, judge sat up at the, at the top, what we now think of as the altar, um, and this eventually became the, the, the Latin cross plan that we know as a church. So it's interesting that churches were designed not from temples at all, but from a law court, which is a very different kind of building. But there was one feat of engineering that, that, that the Romans and Greeks hadn't quite found a solution to. Um, they could put a dome on a circular building like the Pantheon here, but the difficulty of covering a square building with a circular dome, they hadn't quite cracked that. And this is where the Byzantine architects found a solution. They're called pendentives. And this was something which changed architecture in, in a very serious way. Um, it was applied for generations in Italy and France in the Renaissance. And it didn't come to England until centuries later when St. Paul's Cathedral was built. Right, moving on quickly, we come to the next um, episode, which is the style known as Romanesque. Romanesque is the earliest style of what we call medieval architecture. Um, and it's known across Europe as Romanesque, but we call it Norman. And it consists of enormous great pillars, thick walls and tiny little windows. So it's usually quite dark inside a Romanesque building, but it's an easy one to recognize because the arches are round like in Roman architecture. It's got perfect round arches there, which is just like you see in ancient Rome, hence Romanesque. And they're not pointed like Gothic. A good example in England is this one, which is of course Durham Cathedral which has a beautiful Romanesque nave. Other bits were changed later on, but this is an, a, a photograph I'm showing you now, is pretty much um, pure Romanesque. Next we come to the Gothic. And the Gothic is a huge period of time. Um, it's covered by, you know, we don't even know what to call it, medieval Gothic, what do we call it? It goes on forever. And there are three phases to it um, in England. They're called Early English, Decorated and Perpendicular. Sometime late in the 12th century, somebody figured out a new method of vaulting, that's to say the, the roof, um, where the masonry was supported by a series of stone ribs or arches. And that made a huge difference because the thick walls and the massive pillars that we saw in the Romanesque buildings were replaced with this new system. And when used in conjunction with another great innovation, the Gothic arch, suddenly everything changed. So the Gothic arch is pointed and the weight can be more evenly distributed. And I'll leave Mr. Phillips or Mr. Viger to explain exactly how that works. But it meant that with the weight spreading in this way, buildings could go higher, more windows could be added and buildings could become complete all out extravaganzas like our cathedrals and our churches. So by the 14th century, we get elaborate patterns with stone called tracery. Uh, we get stained glass coming in and the pillars become, and the columns become much more elegant. No big tree trunks anymore. They're, they're all light and elegant. Let's look at Milton Abbey. Here's a good example. Milton Abbey has work from different periods of the Gothic. This is the area called the choir, which you can see colored here in pink. The choir is earlier than the rest of the Abbey. This is called decorated. And the transept, which is the bit going across as you come into the main door and you look across at right angles, that's the transept. And that style is later and it's called perpendicular. So at Milton Abbey, we get a lovely example of both those styles of Gothic in place. And the Gothic really reaches its peak with this perpendicular phase. It grows out of a passion for height that the buildings sort of 
reflect this spiritual yearning towards heaven and people start to get competitive you know each town wants to build the biggest cathedral and the taller the better and this is achieved of course by the addition of these things called flying buttresses which you can see here attached to the building making it possible to go taller and taller it's as if the architects are trying to get rid of every square inch of wall and replace it with glass or decoration. This is fan vaulting you see here, where the columns go up and branch out into these wonderful fan shapes. And everything becomes ever more elaborate and columns ever more slender. And the only thing that's left of stone is what's necessary to, to hold up the building. So from the Gothic, we move on to Tudor and Elizabethan. And this one is really, um, I'm going to concentrate on England here, because this is the one we do best. Um, during the Middle Ages, builders were concerned with churches and castles. It was all about keeping people out or keeping people in. And houses were mostly made of mud and timber. But then when the Tudors kind of got, got their feet under the table and everything settled down a bit, they turned their attention to building themselves manor houses which were unfortified and these varied according to what materials were available but here's a good example of a half timbered house as a Tudor house called Little Morton Hall in Cheshire and this is absolutely the Tudor style look at it it's in per really good condition amazing then the Elizabethans wanted to go one step further they kind of went all out for the big statement house they got bigger glass got cheaper and this led to a phase which here at Hardwick Hall was described as more glass than wall it's the kind of ultimate in sophistication and uh, we're in the Elizabethan era so there's a lot of literary enthusiasm going on and buildings started to have loads of mottos and crests and decorative features like we see here Hardwick Hall has a skyline which has I think about six of these um, sets of initials which are commemorating the owner Bess of Hardwick. Elizabeth Shrewsbury was her name in open work all across the top of the building. And after the Elizabethan period, we go to the Renaissance. And it's in the Renaissance that so many uh, things happen in different countries in different ways. While the builders of uh, the north of Europe were creating these great Gothic cathedrals, in Italy, they were breaking away from the medieval style and they were going back, they were looking back to the ideal proportions of Greece and Rome. Here's a building by one of the great Italian architects, Brunelleschi. And this is a building called the Ospedali degli Innocenti, which is in England, uh, would be called a foundling hospital. It was built for the um, care of, of babies that were left without parents. Uh, women, unmarried women, could leave them on the steps of the, of the building and they would be taken care of. And you see this nice touch here that in all the little roundels is an illustration of a, of a little baby in swaddling clothes, which tells you what the building was used for. The other great Renaissance architect was Bramante, who designed St Peter's, the main church in Rome, but also this little Tempietto, which is a kind of ideal classical revival Renaissance building. It's a little round building using Doric columns, and it's a perfect example of Renaissance classical revival. And then we come to the houses. The Renaissance villa was a great thing. This one is by Andrea Palladio who is one of the most famous architects ever. He was so influential that in England, we, we developed a style called Palladian architecture because it's all trying to copy him really. We all want our buildings at a certain date to look like Palladio. This one's just outside Venice, but you can see things a bit similar in and around London and England generally. We didn't really get the Renaissance until the 17th century in the UK. Um, but we do have a couple of really big stars of that style and they converted it to a kind of peculiarly English version of it. Here's Inigo Jones at the Queen's House in Greenwich. 
which uh, is a 17th century building, so quite a lot later than Palladio and Bramante. But nonetheless, going back to that symmetrical, harmonious classicism. And the second one, of course, is Sir Christopher Wren, who with St Paul's Cathedral breaks with our long held English tradition of Gothic and towering spires and decides to build a church with a dome. Cracking on now to the Baroque, which is the 17th century style where everything goes crazy. The Baroque is an elaborate and a lavish style that goes all out. Some people absolutely hate it, but I think it's great. The Baroque is all about extravagance, ornamentation, opulence, theatrical. Can't get more theatrical than the Baroque. And it's associated with the Catholic um, taste of uh, the Counter-Reformation, but it occurs all over the place. In Italy, we see it uh, in the churches, um, in the strange helter-skelter spire of this church by Borromini. We even see it going via France to Russia, where they admired so much the Palace of Versailles that they decided to imitate it in St. Petersburg. And the Baroque has a way of using everything going, but in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. So it wants to ratchet up the drama or express movement. Flights of stairs, statues, fountains. Why have a straight column if you can twist it to look like barley sugar? And why not add some bling while you're about it? This is the Baroque taste. And in England, we were a bit suspicious of it. We prefer things to be a bit understated. And uh, so it's a bit less common in the UK, but there are some good examples. Castle Howard in Yorkshire is a fantastic example, has all the fountains, all the, all the theater, and Blenheim Palace where Winston Churchill grew up is another great Baroque building if you wanna go and take a look at one of them. So next we have neoclassical. And from now on, everything is either neo or revival, or it's rejecting what went before, revisiting another style and changing it a bit. It's a bit like, you know, children always reject what their parents like, and then they reject, their children reject what their parents like. It's kind of what happens. So neoclassical architecture is turning away from the extravagant, the Baroque, and looking back to something a bit more restrained, a bit more orderly, a bit more harmonious, a bit more symmetrical. And it also reflects the intellectual awakening among the classes, middle and upper classes in Europe, which we call the Enlightenment. This is Lord Burlington's villa at Chiswick in London, which instills all those virtues of sort of sober classicism that he so admired. And we also see it in other countries. French and American revolutions returned to the classical style because it represented equality, democracy. It was emblematic of the civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome. This is Thomas Jefferson's house, Monticello in America which is a distillation of all the virtues that he so much admired. And a keen interest in the ideas of the classical architects, and then we bolt Palladio on as well, inspired a return to classicism all over Europe and the United States. These buildings were about power, about democracy, about fairness, and you couldn't get much more classical or neoclassical than the White House. And then we also have in England and in Ireland, where it's really well preserved, what we call Georgian architecture, which happens at the same time. And all over our towns, we had these wonderful buildings, thanks to two big innovations, the terrace and the square. So instead of taking up too much room all over the place, we found town planning in, in the 18th century was building houses going up, not across. And here's an example of one of them now. 
public buildings, also classical um, at this stage. This is Somerset House, um, built by William Chambers, who I hope you will also know because he built the mansion house at Melton Abbey. So we're galloping through the centuries now and we're coming to the Gothic Revival. This is the 19th century. And although it would be fair to say that the Gothic Revival never really died in England because we always preferred it really to um, classicism. Nonetheless, there was a conscious revival in the late 18th and then the 19th centuries uh, to, go, to go medieval. Uh, one guy had a really big effect on, on our thinking at this time as a man called Pugin, um, who urged architects to stay true to the principles of medieval art. And he believed that Gothic was more kind of true to the Christian faith. I think he means the Protestant faith particularly, but that it was kind of appropriate to build in this way. And of course, Victoria and Albert loved this style. They couldn't get enough of it. Balmoral and all these places were built like this. And you can usually tell a, a neo-Gothic or a Gothic revival building because it, it kind of goes a bit further than real Gothic. It's kind of adding some more turrets, a few more crenellations. It's kind of a bit of a Disney version of the Gothic. Um, so it's, it's more Gothic than the Gothic. But the greatest example of it we have in the UK is this one. And that is generally agreed to be the best example of the Gothic revival in the world. And it was also a style favored by other public buildings. For example, railway stations, public schools, universities. You'll see it all over the place, the Gothic revival. So last port of call is modernism. And this is a big one. This is the big one, okay? So dramatic changes, everything different in the 20th century. And so many stars come under that heading that we can only look at a handful here. But basically, thanks to the new materials which were developed in the late 19th century and 20th century, steel, reinforced concrete, the invention of the elevator or lift, suddenly there was a whole new way of building. And just so that you know, anything with ism in it comes into this category. So formalism, brutalism, deconstructivism, you name it. But let's start with the best um, of the early modern movements and that is Art Deco, which you see here on the screen. Um, sleek forms, um, embracing both the machine age and ancient times because they're looking back to things like ancient Egypt, as you can see here. This is the Chrysler building, which is one of the great early skyscrapers in, uh, on Manhattan. We see it again in London, go down the A40 and you go past the Hoover building, which is again inspired by the buildings of ancient Egypt. A kind of interest in zigzag patterns, um, jazzy lines, weird pyramid shapes, all of that comes into Art Deco, in jewelry as well as in architecture. Um, and the illusion of pillars rather than the actual presence of pillars. It's a kind of really interesting period which existed just in the 1920s, but you'll be able to find some good examples if you look around. And then we come to the next style, which is really um, modernism abroad. It's called the international style because it occurs everywhere, like this house in the Netherlands. This is called the Schroeder House or this one in Germany, which was designed by the Bauhaus in the 1920s. Modernist architecture emphasizes function. Its mantra is form follows function. And it's about stripping things back to first principles. That's what inspired this architect, Mies van der Rohe, who coined the phrase, less is more, and whose house here for a Dr. Farnsworth, um, a weekend house outside Chicago, takes that doctrine to extremes. And I often wonder whether she wouldn't have felt more comfortable with some curtains. In the UK, this kind of modernism was brought to us by a, a Russian architect called Bertolt Lubetkin, 
and he settled in London in the in the late 19 teens and founded a group called Tecton and they believed in applying sort of scientific methods of design to architecture and their buildings went counter to all expectations. This is the, the Finsbury Health Centre built in the 1920s which seems to have landed like a kind of spaceship in the middle of this what was then a very run down part of London. Actually, modernism didn't go down very well in the UK at this day. It was, it was great in Europe, everybody loved it, but in, in the UK, they, they didn't really like it. And uh, Lubetkin found himself having commissions for things like the penguin pool at London Zoo, rather than any, any big prestigious commissions. But here it is, the penguin pool. It's uh, something which architectural historians appreciate now even if the penguins at the time didn't particularly like it. After the Second World War, the UK woke up to the possibility of building cheaply and quickly with these new materials available to them so that they could quickly um, repair uh, towns damaged by bombing raids. And this is the period that gives us brutalism. So 50s and 60s is the, is the dawn of hardline modernism in England. Brutalism is actually one of the most despised of all architectural styles, um, but it now has a, a, a real cult following. It's greatly admired, usually by the people who don't actually live in the buildings that they rave about. Okay, so the next ism is postmodernism, and that is an architecture which evolves from the modernist movement, but yet it contradicts many of those mantras. It's not about form following function now, it's about having a bit of fun. So adding some things that you don't expect, the top of the skyscraper, we've got this weird sort of Chippendale broken pediment, which is just there for no other reason that it looks nice. Uh, the architect, Robert Venturi, who built the, the new wing to the, Sains to the uh, National Gallery, the Sainsbury wing, uh, coined the phrase, less is a bore. Let's go back to some, some ideas where you can have some fun. So postmodernism is all about the surprising, uh, the, 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 the startling and the amusing. Familiar shapes are used in unexpected ways. Buildings incorporate symbols just for fun, you know, just for the hell of it. And we see lots of these um, uh, and, and they're very enjoyable to visit. Um, by the 1990s, we get deconstructivism. And this is Frank Gehry, who works like a sculptor rather than an architect, sort of piling things up, constructing and deconstructing. And this example at the, the um, Guggenheim Museum at Bilbao is a really good example of that. This is paving the way for buildings which break all the rules. We've come a long way from the idea of a floor, a roof and four walls. And you might think that free form architecture begins here with the architects who experimented, experimented with binary large objects or what came to be called blob architecture. Blobitecture, as we now call it, is a term originally intended as an insult to describe these controversial amoeba-like buildings. But today it's fully embraced by postmodern architects to define curved and rounded buildings, uh, which are inspired by nature, going back to something more organic and natural than those hardline modernist buildings that I showed you just now. But now we've reached the end of our gallop through architectural history. And we might be tempted to say that we've come full circle. Look at this building by Louis Kahn in the 70s, uh, the Salk Institute um, in La Jolla in California, which is not unlike one of those ancient ziggurat temples, like the temple at Ur. And we might say that freeform architecture dates back, not from modernism, but from prehistoric times. Just look at this Moshe Safdi Marina Bay Sands Resort in Singapore, built in 2011. It looks just like Stonehenge. Thank you very much for listening.
Rose, thank thank you so much. That that was that was abs absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I would love now to um, to go to some questions, um, if we may. And um, and thank you to those of you out there who've um, popped some questions into the Q and A. Um, if anyone um, would like to add any further, then as we're going through, then then please do so. Um, Rose, so so much so much to pick up on um, from that talk. So you know, a huge thank you to you. Um, if I may go with the um, the first question that we've we've had, and um, which is um, to do with um, the the evolution. Um, the question is asked that you you present a pretty um, seamless evolution, but were there any step changes that really catapulted architecture forward? For example, some materials or a person or any, any one thing that could be seen as a real turning point? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. And I think that the, the, the materials is the big um, game changer. So um, those, um, those developments like the, the pointed arch, which made it possible for buildings to, to become much, much taller. Um, those developments like the pendentives, which meant that a dome could be put onto a square building. And then in the 20th century, huge change because of the Industrial Revolution, which had given rise to steel. Steel is a very light material. Steel with reinforced concrete means that you can make a, a wobbly shape to a building like the penguin pool, which could never have happened before. So I think in a way the sort of technical innovations and I'm not a physicist and so I won't be able to go into the nitty gritty, but those technical innovations I think were real game changers. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, so um, we'll go to our next question, which is um, yeah, very, very relevant at the moment. So um, Rose, when we, when we can travel again, uh, which city would you recommend for seeing a variety of architectural styles? Oh, that's such a good question. I mean, there's there are so many, even towns in England where you can see a huge variety of architectural styles. I mean, so many cities are multi-layered. You know, if you're in London, the first picture I showed you on the screen was actually Chester, which, you know, where the shop fronts are everything from um, Gothic, Tudor to uh, classical. So there are so many towns which do have layers and layers of history. If you wanted to study the sort of history of architecture like we do in the West, then I think probably a fantastic starting point would be Rome. I think Rome would be my choice because Rome has the ancient stuff in very, very good condition then all the layers of early Christian, um, medieval, Renaissance, right the way through. It's a fantastic, seamless kind of um, layered cake of architectural styles. So uh, yeah, I couldn't recommend that highly enough. Thank you very much, Rome it is. Okay, um, great. So uh, Rose, how do you think that different peoples or and cultures are reflected through architecture? I think that um, architecture. I, I agree with them. I agree with them, my the man at the beginning there, yeah, the, the the Louvre pyramid. Um, I am Pei, who said that architecture reflects society. I think that you, when you build, you want to say something about your culture and your society, and I think you do get that when you go to so many different um, cultural centres. I wish we studied more world architecture as part of our syllabus for art history because you know we do. The Greeks through to um, modernism, but we don't study the architecture of the East. And I think that would be, it's, it's just like a huge piece of the jigsaw puzzle that's missing. So you can understand a culture through its architecture. And I think unlike painting and sculpture, architecture has a function and therefore it tells you about how people live and how they spend their daily lives and what they want to do as part of that. So I think it's, um, you know, I think it's the most important art form there is really. Thank you. Rose, we'll, we'll go to a, um, a question from Mr. Cloak, um, if I may, Mr. Cloak, if you're there. Yeah, apologies. I can't use the Q&A box as a host. Um, it leads on actually from your question about from architecture and form following mm -hmm. function necessity. Bringing things bang up to date, do you think the move to people home working, working more locally in smaller locations, is going to have a significant impact on the 
prevalence and kind of addition of new large uh, kind of masterpiece buildings that are often locations for large organizations what do you think might be the impact of the recent years and the move to more kind of home and smaller working yeah that's a really interesting thought isn't it because if you think about i mean um, an architect like Richard Rogers, who built the Pompidou Centre in Paris, that was a big icon building. And then he did the, the Lloyd's building in London was for Lloyd's. You know, it's the big statement of, uh, you know, it's a very forward looking building. It looks very modern. It, and, it, and, and it was sort of saying Lloyd's was wanting to say we are a progressive forward thinking company. And look at us. This is what we look like. We're not some fusty old, you know, old fashioned thing. But I think that now I, I wonder whether that's kind of something that's gone because, as you say, those big statement buildings are not needed in the same way. And people are looking at, you know, shepherd's huts and things like that are coming into play, aren't they? I mean, there's a lot of interest in mobile buildings that you can use and add to your existing space. So domestic space is probably going to change quite a lot. I mean, the, the building I, I showed you in in uh, the Netherlands at the beginning of the modernist section is actually a building that was designed for a woman who wanted to be able to change the interior around and actually that Schroeder house has kind of partitions that you can pull across and then open them out again depending on whether you're going to sleep at night or working during the daytime. I think there'll probably be a lot more thought given to that, um, a flexible spaces going forward. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Rose, a, a, a question um, with a, a bit of a local theme. Um, so, a plan for Forum uh, is known as a uniquely Georgian town uh, due to the nature of a lot of rebuilding after the Great Fire. Yeah. Why are there so few examples of Georgian architecture in other places? It's a great shame, isn't it? Um, uh, the People say that um, Dublin's so well preserved because um, it was completely separate from the Queen Victoria and Albert mania for, for building neo-gothic buildings. So um, in, in, the, in the 19th century in England, there was this big move in favor of um, sort of gothic-y um, houses and terraces rather than going tall. So Georgian buildings go very tall and they're quite space efficient because they've tend to, they tend to have four, five or six floors. Whereas Victorian houses, terraced houses tend to spread more that way and so they take up more space and large swathes of, of Georgian um, cities were, were demolished to make room for Victorian building. Dublin is the best preserved Georgian city I think it's got the most amazing uh, Georgian squares and things left M more so um, a lot of them went into disrepair and they're being kind of renovated and things um, have been over the last sort of 40 years or 30 years but yeah I mean I think it was really just um you know, clear it out and make room for the new. Thank you very much, Rose. And uh, a question here, which is um, touches on about the, the Lloyds building, which I know you mentioned in a, in a previous answer. Uh, Mr. Vigar has asked, why do you think inside out buildings such as the new Lloyds building uh, did not catch on or he used to work there? So he's very interested in this answer. Yeah, it's so interesting, isn't it? I mean, Richard Rogers said that when he, when he built the Pompidou Centre, he was very young at the time. He won this commission with, the other, his colleague Renzo Piano, and they were very young. Their design got accepted and they did this real high profile building. After that, he couldn't get any work. He uh, left um, England and went to teach at an American college and was being a taxi driver for a while because nobody wanted to give him a, a, a job. It was only when Lloyds came along that he, and he got that commission that things started to pick up for him again. And I, I think the view is that um, you know, people weren't really ready for that kind of radical building. Um, in England, the view is that in England, people are more traditional about architecture. They like, they like revival. They like oldie worldy. They don't tend to like modern. There are very few modernist houses in the UK, architect designed modernist houses compared with in Europe. And I think uh, the inside out building was just you know it was just too much for people they just thought what what is this you know it was a it was a kind of step too far we weren't ready for it but now the Pompidou Centre has it you know has a huge following but at the time it was completely reviled you know so many people were hostile to it 
Um, but I'd be interested interested to know what it's like to work in the Lloyd's building. It's got that fantastic atrium, hasn't it? I mean, you know, it must be amazing. Thank you, Rose. So, uh, do do you think that do you think architectural pieces are reflections of our emotions? And also, do you think that our society creates goals for luxury with architecture? That's a, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I think that. Um, architecture, we're becoming much more aware of um, the idea of architecture being sustainable and being something which we can produce in harmony with the environment. So I think the sort of hardline brutalism is, is not the way we see the world now. I think we want to do something which um, helps us to, to be responsible um, with nature. But having said that, I mean, there are still people building, you know, big, big houses, which make a statement about perhaps their, their status, their wealth, you know, a building can do that. And I don't know how, how far that has changed. Be interesting to, to, to see what architects themselves think about that, because I, I don't know the answer. But I suspect that wherever a building can say something about the person who owns it, There'll always be some degree of um, restraint and some degree of ostentation. Thank you, thank you. So, um, uh, Rose, we've got a number of pupils out there uh, watching the presentation tonight, and um, and we've got a question of: Do you think architecture is a, a rewarding topic for an EPQ? Yes, I do, and I think the reason is that you know we don't study architecture at school level. You know, people when people study architecture. They, they first begin to study it at university. There is no awareness of architecture as a, as a subject before that. So EPQ would be the perfect way of doing it. And I know Ruby Staple is already doing an EPQ on architecture, which is fantastic. But the idea of a subject which, which pulls in so many different areas, you know, about, about our culture and our society, um, an architect, you, you might argue that an architect has, has a sort of social responsibility, um, you know, uh, as a player in society to make, make things work. And that would be a very interesting subject. But I think for an EPQ as a sort of, you know, um, a little sort of distinct entity that you wouldn't otherwise study at school, I think architecture would be a fantastic subject to pursue. Thank you very much. Uh, a really interesting question here. Do you have a desert island building, a favourite? Is there one out there? Do you know what I think? I think if I could have that um, Palladio Villa Rotunda on, on a desert island, that would that would suit me down to the ground. Yeah, I'd be happy. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, Rose, if I may, um, just a, a question that um, is uh, in line with um, some of the things that we that we discussed um, a few minutes ago. Um, how far do you think the pandemic will change architecture um, with, as we talked about before, with more people working from home? Do you think this will change architecture in some of the major cities in the UK? Yes. I think it will. I mean, I think one thing that um, is being discussed, and I think um, it, in cities like Paris, perhaps a bit more in advance than, than we are. But the idea of cities becoming sort of zones where the center of the city is no longer the working hub of the city. So it's not, not like the sort of center of banking and everything else. But people are talking about city centers being uh, places you go to for culture and recreation, for parks, for museums and galleries, for theaters. But that the shopping and the and the sort of offices stuff gets taken out of that. And people are also talking. Architects are also talking about this is a concept that um, modern architects start, first started talking about. Well, actually, nineteenth-century architects talk, talked about the garden city, where you have nobody's that far away from shops, schools, um, leisure centres. It's all done on a sort of radial axis nobody's too far away from green spaces. People are looking at that again, saying nobody should work that far away from the home. Nobody should commute. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we're looking at cities in the future which have bicycle lanes leading to these various different hubs. And a lot of what you do is no more than 10, 15 minutes away from where you live. It'd be an interesting idea. I mean, it's a huge town planning proposition.
<laughs> Thank you. So um, on, on, on that note, then looking looking towards the future race, um, where, where do you think the future of architecture is headed? Will we focus more on functionality and a modernistic approach, particularly with many people spending more time in their homes? I hope that I hope the way it goes is that we'll become more aware of um, of the environment and the damage that is done to the environment by commuting, by um, the the more you build little houses, the more land you take up. You know, the idea that um, architecture might play a part in making us more sustainable, generally, I think would be a very good thing. And if it means working more from home, that's great because you know we we can all sit at our desks in a in a in a small room we don't have to be in the lloyd's building you know we don't have to be in a in a glass coated office to be able to function effectively so i think it is going to change the future of architecture it's difficult to envisage how it's going to look but i'm looking to the architects of, of the future like ruby uh staple there to tell me how it's going to look and i think it's 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 not going to be the same there's going to be a big revolution big change Thank you very much, Rose. Thank you. So if I could at this point just ask if uh, if there are any more questions out there, uh, please do pop them in the Q&A box. Um, Rose, uh, may I just ask a quick question about whether you think, um, do, you, do you think that due to the kind of the, the, the pace of scientific discovery over the years, do you think the, um, the pace of architectural change has also accelerated through time due to some of those discoveries? I think so, because I think that, you know, the, the fact that there are so many isms in the 20th and 21st century, um, so many that I couldn't possibly cover them, suggests that acceleration has become really sort of exponential. So, you know, the Gothic style of architecture existed for hundreds of years, but I think now the, the change in materials being used and things means that change happens every decade or every couple of decades rather than every hundred years. And so I think that that's a, a huge difference. Um, you know, we've got since the since the Second World War with the advent of plastics and and uh, usable materials which we wouldn't have thought of using before. I mean, think of the only thing being available being stone and then brick. You know, we've got so many things that can be used now that it's impossible to imagine it coming to anything but a kind of boiling point. And then the next question will be. Um, which of those materials is is safe to use, and which and which is, you know, using up too many of our um, really important resources on the planet. And if I may ask, Rose, do you do you, do you think from from what you've seen, do you think um, you know when, for example, um, you know some of the the photos we looked at for some of the the sort of twenty first century designs, um, do you think that planning laws are restrictive on architecture, or do you think they encourage them in the UK? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I, I, I think it depends on whether it's a public or a private building. I think um, we've got very, very um, robust planning laws when it comes to building certain types of thing. Um, you know, you, you can't very easily put a sort of blobby texture kind of building in the middle of a city without, without quite a lot of um sort of uh, complaint but an architect would argue the contrary an architect says that that the british are, are averse to um any kind of modernism in their domestic architecture so it's much harder to get planning permission for a for a house a modernist house than it is for for an office block and the complaint is that what what happens as a result of that is that you know, houses in Britain are, are designed en masse by builders, but they're not particularly um, sort of standalone architect designed um, what an interesting buildings in their own right. I mean, it's, a, it's a debate that because I mean, there are all sorts of arguments on both sides, but it's 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 a debate which has, you know, quite a robust following on both sides, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Rose, um, we've uh, you. I'm, I'm obviously so grateful to you um, for your time. Um, in, you know, in, in preparing this talk for us this evening and sharing your 
um, incredible knowledge with us. Um, I'd like to um, you know, thank you very, very much on, on behalf of not only me, but also um, everyone out there who's, who's watching. It's been a, a really fascinating evening and um, you know, we're, I'm very aware of the amount of work that goes into it. So um, we, we're hugely grateful to you. Um, so I'm therefore, I'm extremely keen that you get, you get a, a, some evening and a chance to relax um, before another busy day tomorrow. So thank you, thank you so much. Um, it's extremely kind of you and, and thank you to everyone who's been involved this evening. Thank you for your questions and thank you to those um, attendees out there um, who've taken the time to come along and support the um, MA Experience Talks. So um, I'm going to say thank you very much to everyone and, uh, and, and good night. And Rose, thanks again. That was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.